There are a million reasons to listen to Odeo, and this is one. I'm calling Corey Doctorow to talk about how we're going to put together all these miscellaneous pieces, both technically and legally. Hey, David. Hi, Corey. How are you? Very well, thank you. Now, people know you as a novelist. They know you as a uh, one of the founders of the world's most popular weblog, boingboing.net. Co-editor, but not founder. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. L- yeah, it was a print magazine when I was a teenager. No way. Oh, yeah. Huh. They may know you as a digital rights activist. They may not know, however, that you, in, in 2001, you wrote a really, uh, I don't know, prescient article posted on the web called Metacrap. Uh-huh. And it, it's completely relevant to what uh, my book is is talking about. Huh. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, because maybe the the broadest theme of everything is miscellaneous is, in fact, that there's tremendous benefit to creating a huge pile, just a huge pile of stuff, so long as, as we can get enough metadata, enough information about the information attached to it, that we can go back through it any way we want and pull out what we need and organize it the way we want. So it all depends mm-hmm. upon the metadata. Right. And Metacrap is, is, a, is a very strong, coherent, pointed critique of the dream of metadata. Yeah, or at least the dream of explicit metadata. So what is the problem with explicit metadata? Well, the problem with explicit metadata, as I sum up in the essay, are, is manifold. But, you know, it's, it's that people lie. Right? They tell you what they, what they think you want to hear. Or they tell you what they think they believe, even if it's not what they actually believe. Um, people are dumb, right? They, they, they sometimes just have bad classification information. People are lazy, so they misclassify because they, um, because they, they can't be bothered to, to properly classify. Um, people are, uh, um, we, we can't all agree. Right? Uh, this, everything is miscellaneous, as you say, so we can't all agree on the best way to classify information. And so on. So, you know, that's a kind of sampler of the, the reasons that, that the idea that we'll all make it all work is, is um, are so flawed. I remember um, stopping by the booth of a company that um, met, made some kind of metadata product at um, a PC Forum conference, Esther Dyson's old conference out in the desert in, uh, in Arizona. And they said, you know, well, we've got this metadata program and, and it has these, this taxonomy that describes you know, the best way to organize all the information in the world, and, and this is what we've deployed, and so on. And I said, well, what do you do if, if your taxonomy doesn't agree with someone else's? And they said, oh, well, that's easy. We, we have a way of um, drawing lines between those taxonomies. So if you, if you call it a widget and we call it a, a what's it, um, we can just make an equivalence between those two and map them over. And I remember at the moment thinking, there's something missing from that explanation. And it was a little while later that I, that I figured out what it was, which is, what if you call it a widget and I don't have a name for it? Or what if you call it a widget and I disagree that it should be called anything at all? You know, you say that this is this is um, the sovereign territory of uh, of uh, Serbia Montenegro, or Montenegro, and you say no, it's a suburb of Serbia. Um, there are just a lot of categories of information that we just can't draw lines between in in our rival taxonomies. Or you say it's a, a a species, and I say that it's in fact uh, just. Um, an offshoot, right? Or, or you say that it's a genuine religious experience of the uh, numinous, and I say that it's a hallucination triggered by a center of your brain left over from when some distant ancestor of yours discovered that by hallucinating a god figure, he was able to survive longer, catch more antelopes, and therefore have more babies. And so, I want to classify this as hallucination engendered by um, by accident of evolution, and you want to classify it as genuine religious experience. And I have a feeling that both of us would be slightly peeved if the other's um, label were applied to it. Even just elevating something as, as being worthy of being categorized at least at the same level is itself often a political act. And, and... Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we call things is, is pretty important. If explicit meta, uh, metadata is a real problem, it raises problems that just can't be solved. I mean, they, they just, it's not that we're not good at it. It's the problems cannot be solved because we're not going to agree about these deep questions of how we organize. Then, mm. if it's also the case that we need metadata more than ever in order to make use of, make sense of the 
unbelievable amounts of information that's now available to us. What do we do? Well, so I think part of the answer is implicit metadata. Um, I don't think that explicit metadata is useless. I think that it needs to be taken with boulders full of salt and that building your your hopes on a world where everyone becomes an amateur taxonomist and tax, and, and classifies all the uh, all the beasts that sort of that fly in the sky and swim in the swim in the water and walk on the land is is probably not not on. But I think we can do a lot with implicit metadata. I can find out a lot about what I think of as um, up tempo uh, happy music, which may not in fact correspond to music that's either up tempo or or objectively happy by what a musicologist might think of, by um, combining a uh, playlist decisions that emerge from my um, from my music player uh, with uh, biometric information about how I react when that music comes on. So it can tell me something about how I feel that I might not know. Um, so I want to ask you about tagging in particular, mm-hmm. because tags are explicit. People sit down and they they tag their whatever it is, the photo or the page that they're trying to remember. Tags are very, very explicit, but the social effect of them, the folksonomies that emerge from looking at uh, the aggregate of tags, is not done explicit. Uh, so do, are, do tags do, do tags break the critique or escape the critique of metacrap? Or are they just more metacrap? <laughs> no, I think that there's, I think that, that well, of course, all all technological phenomena that are associated with commercial success in, um, uh, accumulate a certain amount of, um, of, of overhyped accolades. So obviously tags aren't uh, the panacea um, for all problems, but tags do in fact uh, manage to escape some of the great failings of explicit metadata schemes that, that preceded them by allowing people to have their own individualized taxonomies for, for allowing you to call it um, uh, the sovereign territory of Montenegro and for me to call it the um, uh, poor blasted suburb of, of Serbia, but um, but but uh, the the as you point out, the most important thing that tags um, do, the the most important effect of tags is the implicit effect. It's the it's the effect of noticing that these people treat this kind of information in the same way, and then deriving some conclusions from it in the same way that Google has this implicit uh, uh, ability to understand the web by looking at links that are made. And I'd say that the big difference between uh, Google's implicit in- inspection of the Internet structure and uh, folksonomy is that um, Google only works well when you're implicit. As soon as you get explicit with Google, it starts to break. So uh, search engine optimizers or um, uh, spammers, link spammers, link farmers, and so on, all of the, and, and Google bombers, they all seek to subvert Google by explicitly creating links for Google to find and index. And it's really only the people who naively create links between pages without thinking about whether or not Google will index them that, that produce useful material for Google. And Google goes to some lengths to try and figure out who's making links for its benefit and throw those links away so that it's only examining those accidental links. Um, tagging, by contrast, seems to invite a um, – uh, uh, or seems to, to derive benefit from explicit collaboration. So um, what tagging seems to do – is first allow you to atomically and individually create some folksonomy around the information that you look at and, and make it as miscellaneous as you want, add as many characters, characteristics or tags as you want to, to the information you're looking at, but then subsequently helps you find at very low search costs people who classify information like you. So it, it knocks out some of the search costs that are normally associated with big collaborative projects like taxonomies. And, um, and the coordination costs and makes it very easy. Um, it, it tags seem to have mastered the trick of driving people towards convergence. Um, and in some instances, that's with simple technology like, like autocomplete, uh, where as you start typing a tag, uh, the most commonly used uh, version of that tag automatically populates the field, which provides a, a kind of technological incentive. And then the, the social incentive to tag uh, like others do, also seems to drive people to convergence that um, once you have effective tag-based collaboration, I'm thinking, for example, of Flickr tags that, like, uh, my favorite one is the decay tag, which is pictures of things that are decaying, whether that's um, old, beautiful, sagging barns or the, the rich texture of rust or uh, a leaf that's gone to crumble or, or even, you know, that stuff that's become a science experiment in the back of the fridge. 
Yeah, which has become uh, completely un- unpredictably. It's become one of the most popular tags at Flickr. I mean, who would have guessed that decay? Yeah, it's really, you know? it's really shocking. And there's, and of course, there is a certain amount of social capital that accrues to people who who now explicitly tag with decay in order to show up in that stream. There's also occasionally economic uh, incentive as well. For example, at um, at eBay, there's a mm-hmm. strong incentive to list your your computer your laptop as a notebook not as a portable i may have gotten that wrong but whatever the common phrase is so it'll hmm. be found and you'll sell it it's probably it's still the case that you can find great deals on ebay by searching for the wrong one the less popular one um and and you know if i were a smart reseller of laptops i'd be searching for portables buying them and relisting them as laptops <laughs> Um, as you know, that um, if you're looking for a bargain at eBay, you should look for misspellings. You should look for right, not right. book. Plan because, pilot. <laughs> right, plan pilot or not book, because not a lot of people are going to be finding those. But, um, right. was, actually, it, there is a serious point here, which is that not only do folksonomies um, enable a taxonomy, so to speak, to emerge that may be more representative, but because uh, a, folk, a folksonomy is simply the the tip of, of the iceberg so to speak it's what are the most popular terms but all the other terms are still searchable so even if you never thought to call it a portable um you or a notebook you can still search and find the portables or notebooks by using that that phrase so it allows a multiplicity of of taxonomies so one of the most interesting um uses of implicit metadata in um in in tags is what Flickr has done to disambiguate multiple um, meanings of tags or multiple senses of tags, so something like um, uh, bobcat, right? So there's the actual animal, the bobcat, and then there's the sports team. And um, when you search for uh, for Flickr for bobcat, they'll show you uh, that they have discovered at least two different senses for bobcat, and they'll show you a bunch of thumbnails for each. And the way that they detect that there are two different senses in which bobcat is being used is by looking at the cluster of tags around it and the activity around it. And so they examine kind of the implied subject about it. In my book, I actually use the example of Capri, where it's the island Capri, the Ford Capri, uh, and there's a motel Capri that shows up for some reason. Uh, And they do this, the remarkable thing is they do it, as you say, completely by looking at the tags and not by doing any analysis of of the picture itself. And and remarkably accurate, which is, I think, actually uh, a very good answer or rebuttal to the criticism that, with uh, the tags are chaos, and as you get more and more of them, it'll get more and more chaotic. Because it turns out when you ha- when you have a lot of them, the statistical analysis becomes really pretty precise. Right now, that isn't to say that there aren't things that are just Flickr invisible because they're mistagged, uh, and I think there there really are lots and lots of Flickr invisible materials um, because they're mistagged. But the point of Flickr is that the use case for a searcher isn't to exhaustively discover all the photos of of the island of Capri, but rather to discover the, the, the right photo of the island of Capri. And with enough material, um, you don't the chances that you'll find a, a good enough photo of the island of Capri are pretty high, even if you don't find exactly the photo of the island of Capri you're looking for. Yeah, and if you're if you're looking for the pictures of Capri because you want to go for a vacation there, it probably doesn't much matter if you look at the first hundred and you miss. There's some that are misclassified. You're not seeing all five hundred thousand of them. So now, on the other hand, if you're a stock photographer who's hoping that someone will come along and buy your Capri photos, it's pretty it's pretty bad news that um, that you've misclassified your Capri photo. Well, this actually brings me to the second thing that, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to to ask you about, um, given your your experience. Uh, if you're a stock photographer trying to sell photos of Capri, even if it can be found, you're probably screwed at Flickr because there's 100,000 of them that are there available for free, unlicensed, or actually mm-hmm. Creative Commons licensed. Uh, mm-hmm. And yours is, is going to have to be pretty darn good um, for somebody to actually shell out money for it. So if we imagine a world in which there is there are so many resources, just unimaginable amounts, and we know already the sort of remarkable oh, achievements we can make collectively using these resources. From the point of view of of digital rights, copyright, protecting the rights of artists, and so forth, what what gets in the way? What is getting in the way of our getting the most use as a culture out of what we're creating? Right. Well, I think that the the most um, 
a radical change that we've had in copyright isn't the duration or the scope or the or the penalties, but rather it's the merging of the rules that govern commerce and the rules that govern culture. So, and so I think that the single most important thing that we can do to ensure our ongoing use of material and the ongoing cultural uh, um, production of material is to bifurcate the rules again so that we have a set of rules for commerce and a set of rules for culture. And we, we've already got that in, in, in a sense de facto because most of our uh, uh, interpersonal relationships in respect of copyrighted work are governed by a kind of folk copyright, a set of norms that reflect our intuition about how we should respect each other, not, the, not what the law actually says. No one really worries that when you hit control R to reply to an email, that the first thing it does is make a holus bolus copy of that first email, which is itself a copyrighted work, um, and then allow you to insert your own commentary as an interleaf uh, between the paragraphs. That's how you know the internet was designed by engineers, not lawyers. Right? No lawyer would have designed an internet in which um, every act of replying to a message first triggered a massive act of copyright infringement. The BBC, which had been remarkably progressive in trying to get its own archive out and, and reusable and, and mixable and mashable, nevertheless came up with their own license, uh, rejecting the Creative Commons one, in part because they wanted to be able to say no if somebody wanted to take one of their snippets from their archive and remix it in a way that was blatantly objectionable, it might be neo-Nazis or some horrible act of sexual predation, but they wanted to retain that moral right. Do you think that was, uh, that was right of them? The BBC needed to square up the rights with uh, rights holder groups, um, with independent producers, with uh, uh, guilds of, of actors and producers, and with institutional rights holders. Um, whom they had to negotiate with, and their feeling was that by uh, creating a moral rights license that they would be able to um, appease those those people. They were also worried that uh, the Red Top Press, the, the Murdoch Press in Britain, who already loved to hate the BBC and to make trouble for them, would um, uh, adore the opportunity to put up a big headline that says neo-Nazis use BBC material to make their point. Um, but you know, I think that, the, that this is a question of media literacy. If it becomes the norm that we all understand that people sample other people's work in order to make some, in order to make new works without their permission and that it doesn't imply an endorsement, then such a headline would be no more meaningful than um, Oxford English Dictionary provides raw material of hate speech. <laughs> Thank you so much, Corey. Uh, you're just an endless stream of knowledge and clarity and insight. And it's a pleasure talking with you. Thanks so oh, much. Oh, well, that's kind of you to say, David. That's Corey Doctorow, author, co-editor of boingboing.net, digital rights activist. I'm David Weinberger. I'm the author of Everything is Miscellaneous, The Power of the New Digital Disorder, and a fellow at Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Thanks to the Berkman Center and to Wired for making this podcast series possible. To hear other podcasts in this series, go to the Wired blog Epicenter at blog.wired.com business.